Violence and death welcomed baby Andrew Jackson into the world. More precisely, into America. Into the remote backcountry between North and South Carolina. He's born on the Ides of March, just a few weeks after his father died in an accident. Then when he's just a young boy, British soldiers in the Revolutionary War capture Jackson and his brother and take them as prisoners. They're basically starved and abused, and at one point Jackson refuses to shine one of the British officer's boots who's keeping them. That officer takes out a saber and slashes Jackson, who's only 13, slashes him across the face and leaves a scar that he'll have for the rest of his life. Eventually, his mother orchestrates a prisoner exchange, and she rescues her two sons. But Jackson's brother dies just a few days later from the mistreatment and the smallpox they caught while they were there. Jackson has a second brother who also dies during the war. And while Jackson's still recovering, his mother goes to Charleston to help care for other prisoners, and she gets cholera and dies. So by 14 years old... Andrew Jackson is an orphan. War and death have taken every single person in his family. And for the rest of his life, he fights back. I think that taught him the whole world is rough. The whole world is violent. Um, Everybody suffers at the hands of someone else. That was Barbara Baer with the Library of Congress. And I'm Lillian Cunningham with the Washington Post. This is the seventh episode of Presidential. We shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you. A date which will live in infamy. This episode is about violence. It's about the violence and sadness of Andrew Jackson's personal life. It's about the violence of his military campaigns and his policies as president against Native Americans. And it's about the metaphorical violence and conflict that make up a dynamic democracy. Let's not start at the beginning, though. We'll start about 200 years later, right now, in this current moment. Andrew Jackson's name is all over the American South today. Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson, Alabama, Jacksonville, Florida. His face is controversially on the $20 bill. There are two main associations that tend to come up with him today. One is the Indian removal and the Trail of Tears. Jackson was largely responsible for clearing Native Americans off their lands in the Deep South so that that land could go to white men. The other association with Jackson today is with the rise of the modern presidency and the idea of majority rules democracy. His election came about when more people were gaining the right to vote, more white men were gaining the right to vote, and Jackson was seen in many ways as the first self-made common American to be elected by the power of the people. So to work our way back in time now, and begin to understand the role that Jackson played in shaping the America we have today, I spoke with Steve Inskeep. He's the co-host of NPR's Morning Edition and the author of Jackson Land. Uh, Jackson comes to us with a number of different images as this gigantic American hero from the past generations and more recent generations. He's seen as this awful, awful racist human being, uh, and neither of those images is entirely wrong. But... I also learned that this was a guy who seemed to think several steps ahead in ways that the people around him didn't realize. And in fact, some historians have written of Jackson as a rather narrow-minded guy, which in some ways he was, hot-tempered, always ready for a fight, ready for a duel, willing to kill someone, actually did kill a person in a duel. Let's let's not overlook mm-hmm. that. But he was a guy who seemed to use his temper in certain ways. Uh, use it to manipulate people, to push people in the direction he wanted them to go. And he would also restrain himself when that seemed wise. This is a guy who thought several steps ahead, thought for the long term, even if we wish in many instances he'd been going for a different goal. Andrew Jackson used anger and confrontation as tools throughout his life, 
starting at an early age. He would regularly challenge people to fights. Some estimates even say he was in close to a hundred duels. And he would use these partly to move up and cement his place in the social structure. As Steve alluded to, in one of these duels, he killed lawyer Charles Dickinson. But not before Dickinson puts a bullet into Jackson so close to his heart that Jackson can never have it removed. So he has a, a scar from a British soldier's sword across his forehead. He has a bullet lodged near his heart. Yeah. Maybe this is too poetic, but do you think that some of these physical scars really did shape him and it really made certain moments in his life sort of stick with him in a visceral way? Oh, I think absolutely so. He wrote about the scar on his head very late in life. It wasn't like he forgot about it and it happened when he was a teenager. Um, and he had other kinds of scars. He, he bore every other kind of insult uh, as a wound as severe as that bullet in his chest that he carried around and another in his shoulder, by the way. But he was that way even before he had the bullet in the chest. He was a combative guy all his life, as far as we know. Something drove this young man. And we can try to psychoanalyze him at a great distance and say maybe it was the loss of his father. I don't know. Maybe it was the loss of his, of his mother. Maybe it was and the his culture. Siblings, and his right? siblings, yeah. And maybe it was the culture in which he was raised. Uh, he was on some version of the frontier all his life, even though he started in the Carolinas. It wasn't very far west, but, but it was a frontier nation, in effect, in the 1700s. And uh, he he was accustomed to fight. He believed that when he started fighting, he always had to win, and he very nearly always did. And when he couldn't, he was smart enough to avoid just that exact fight. Um, and there was something that, there was something pushing him forward that I am reluctant to set down to a single cause. Maybe all the circumstances of his life could have been different and he would have still been that same driving, determined personality. I don't know where that comes from. Here's the condensed version of his life after he's orphaned. A couple years after the death of his family, Jackson decides to study law. And by the time he's about 21, he moves to Nashville to practice it. He eventually serves in a series of political positions. He is a state representative, he's a judge. But the way he really makes his name is as a fighter when he becomes the major general of Tennessee's state militia. Most notably, he wins a series of battles against the Creeks, a Native American people in the South. He also wins the Battle of New Orleans against the British. That makes him a national hero because it's this huge, decisive underdog victory for America. It shocks everyone and it essentially ends the War of 1812, securing the United States' full independence from the British. We heard about that in the Madison episode, if you listen to that one. In the meantime, Jackson has fallen in love with a woman named Rachel in Nashville. This brings a little bit of levity to Jackson's life and to this portion of the episode. Say I don't know Andrew Jackson at all, and I'm set up on a blind date with him. How would you, how would you describe what, what I'm about to encounter? Uh, well, I think that if Andrew Jackson likes you and is interested in you, you'll have a great time. <laughs> And he would be uh, gentlemanly and courtly and look after you and look after your honor and everything else because he was that kind of guy to his friends and to those that he admired. There, there is actually a great romantic story involving Andrew Jackson. He met uh, this young woman, Rachel, and eventually came to marry her even though she had not completed her divorce mm -hmm. from an abusive husband. And you can look at that lots of different ways. He was criticized and mocked at the time for being a, her, making her a bigamist or whatever. Um, you can certainly see Jackson's not, he wasn't that interested in following the rules exactly. But also he fell in love with this woman and was willing to put up with decades and decades of crap to have her. And he didn't care. Or he did care. He got violently angry, but he wasn't going to turn against her. 
And so if it was a blind date, you'd be just fine. Now, if he was thinking that you were in some way in his way, it might be real I trouble. Might die. <laughs> you, you, you might die. You might die, or you might be threatened sternly uh, and, and basically threatened with death uh, and be aware that you were facing someone who would be willing to go to that extreme because he had before. John Meacham is the author of American Lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House. It won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for Biography. I asked him to describe Jackson for me and to tell me a bit about the characterizations we have today that seem accurate and inaccurate about Jackson. He was about 6'2 and weighed about 140 pounds. He was uh, very thin. Um, he was had a great head of hair uh, and was highly and self-consciously courtly. Uh, he would have been very attentive to you. Uh, part of that was his attempt to be polished, though he came from a fairly rough-hewn uh, background, would always have been uh, conscious of being watched and observed and judged. Uh, part of that was the social insecurity that came from being a self-made man. Uh, someone who had come from the bottom rungs of white society to rising to the pinnacle. I think the idea that Jackson was simply a wild man uh, was 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 entirely a creature of populism and of passion is wrong. I think there was far more calculation and uh, subtlety to him than the popular impression goes. Um, and sometimes he wanted to play the wild man for his own purposes, but. I think the greatest mischaracterization of Jackson is that he was this bloody-minded, uh, unnuanced figure, and I, I think that's inaccurate. Jackson was a, was the product of a violent upbringing I mean, and, and a disturbing one, but he, at critical moments, knew how to constrain his own passion to at least achieve whatever end he was trying to achieve at the time at the moment so his temper was like a summer storm uh could be ferocious for a moment and then pass uh and he had a weakness for grand statements and would you know announce that he would do things like i will kill the bank of the united states you know he had a a uh a weakness for hyperbole what was the thing that really drew you to him and to studying him and writing about the him? vividness of his character I mean the, the and the and the his capacity to be subtle and strong while projecting an image of uh, hawkishness and and the journey he made from obscurity to being the president of the United States. The first six presidents were either Virginia planters or Adamses from Massachusetts. Jackson, as the seventh president, was the first self-made man to reach the pinnacle, and that was intrinsically dramatic. I asked Barbara Baer at the Library of Congress what it is that's driving Andrew Jackson this whole time, even from a young age, toward fighting, toward fame, thrusting him toward leadership and ultimately the presidency. Is it a desire for power? Is it a desire to feel part of the social fabric? I, I think all of those things, but most importantly, he wants honor. And of course, another name for duels were affairs of honor. And I think that in some ways it's a paradigm for his whole presidency in that um, he becomes an, what many people feel to be an overly strong president abusing executive power but what Jackson felt he was doing was representing the will of the people and standing up for the people and standing up for his own honor. So when he said, I don't want a protective tariff and if Congress produced something else, he vetoed it. And this was very much like calling the Congress out as if he was in a duel with Congress. He also developed a kind of scrappiness. You know, he's later known as Old Hickory because the hickory stick is very tough and also because he was a tough commander and you can wield the stick against your own soldiers at times, so that's the other side of his toughness. But he had that kind of ramrod toughness even as a kid, and um, laws weren't necessarily made for Andrew Jackson, but extremely charismatic and able to network, and that was also a very important thing later in his presidency. 
and also his idea of womanhood and protection of womanhood it comes in a way from his love for his mother who was a very pious woman but also very prejudiced against the Indians and um, he replicates that in a way when he meets Rachel Jackson in Nashville he lives in the boarding house that is run by her mom and um, he falls in love with her and she was described as a very sprightly witty um, wonderful horsewoman he also she had many characteristics in common with his mother including her piety and um, also a propensity for slaveholding. She was from a slaveholding family. And Andrew Jackson himself, very early when he began to make money, he almost immediately began acquiring slaves. Barbara walked me through some of the love letters between Rachel and Andrew Jackson. Many of them are this arresting mix of Jackson's dispatches from the field about how many people he's killed, and then loving romantic words to her. Here's one letter from Rachel to him, which gives a sense of their care for each other. She, she, you know, she was often described as illiterate. She wasn't illiterate, but she didn't spell as well as everyone might. But she was very articulate. And this is um, a, a letter from her heart. The salutations of her letters to Andrew are often my dearest life or my dear husband. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew Jackson's letters to Rachel usually started, my love, my dearest heart, my dear wife. There's no question they had a passionate and loving marriage. So she's writing to him from the Hermitage. She's at home while he's at war. February 10, 1814. My dearest life, I received your letter by express. Never shall I forget it. I have not slept one night since. And I'm going to be skipping through the parts of the letter. My dear, pray, let me conjure you by every tie of love of friendship to let me see you before you go again. I have borne it until now. It has thrown me into fevers. I am very unwell. My thoughts is never diverted from that dreadful scene. Oh, how dreadful to me. The mercy and goodness of heaven to me. You are spared perils and dangers, so many troubles. My prayers is unceasing. How long, O Lord, will I remain so unhappy? No rest, no ease. I cannot sleep. All can come home but you. I never wanted to see you so much in my life. Let me know, and I will fly on wings of the purest affection. My prayers, my tears, is for your safety day and night. Our dear little son is well. He says many things to sweet Papa. And then she signs off from your dearest friend and faithful wife until death, Rachel Jackson. Mm-hmm. So it's That's a moving beautiful. letter about the separation and you know her anxiety for him. And little does she know that this is just the beginning of his long life of public service. Mm-hmm. And um, this is a theme for many wives of presidents. They don't necessarily want their husbands to be as ambitious as they are. But Jackson did have political ambition and he would serve in Congress, and he would run for president, and Rachel just did her best to go along with that. So how exactly does Jackson get to the presidency? If you listened to last week's John Quincy Adams episode, you'll remember that Jackson got the most votes in the election in 1824, but since he didn't quite have enough for a majority, the decision went to the House of Representatives and they chose John Quincy Adams instead. So Jackson comes back fighting four years later, and one of his rallying cries is that the government is controlled by special privilege, by a small handful of elites, and that it's time for true majority rule. His campaign in 1828 in many ways transforms American politics to this day. You were asking what kind of fueled Jackson, and anger was one of the things, that, and vengeance were common themes. And he was, of course, enraged, as were his supporters, that even though he had done better than Adams, he was not the president. And this is really when he started to organize very strongly a grassroots campaign for the next presidential election in which he was successful, and he won in a landslide. During that 1828 campaign, it was especially a very dirty campaign. We sometimes think 
now that this is all new, you know, the name calling, the, you know, the, the kind of um, cruel things that candidates say about one another, but it goes way back. In 1828, uh, John Quincy Adams was attacked by the Jacksonians as being elitist and educated and effete and a Washington insider. And Andrew Jackson was a the hero of New Orleans who had liberated the United States firmly and forever from the British, a kind of follow-up to George Washington. And I think that in terms of presidential leadership, we can compare Jackson and Washington. And in fact, his own followers did that. They're both physically imposing, tall, um, handsome, charismatic men who filled the rooms that they were in. They could be very elegant when they needed to be. And also, they were war heroes. So George Washington gave us independence through the Revolutionary War, and Andrew Jackson gave us independence again through the War of 1812 and his victory at New Orleans. So that was one way that he was figured in the campaign. Here's Steve Inskeep again. It wasn't just that it was a war hero. It was that Jackson had a story. Jackson had a narrative about himself, which fit his politics really well. And I'm not sure that that was true of some of the earlier presidents necessarily. They, they are great in retrospect, but they were elected by a relatively small group of people. A few insiders chose who would be the nominees, and a relatively small electorate would, would vote for them. But Jackson had this narrative, this story that could appeal to people in a much broader way. Being a war hero was a huge part of it. It made him the most famous American of his time, but it was really only part of it because the rest of it was that he was born uh, in the Carolinas to a very modest family. He was orphaned in youth. He started life with nothing, and he had risen to these great heights. And that was something that completely played into his political philosophy such as it was and the political philosophy of the Democratic Party as it, as it, as it evolved. He had a story to tell, and that's something that every politician since has realized that they need to have. You need to have a political narrative. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you really stand for? And you know, why, why should I relate to you? To what extent did he um, sort of make a point of using that as his way of gaining popularity versus it just so happened that he really did have a pretty incredible life story? Oh, he, he was using that life story. Although we should be careful, he wasn't out on a debate stage right. <laughs> uh, telling his story because pr- presidential candidates did not campaign in that time. In fact, Jackson went farther than presidential candidates uh, before him simply because as an incumbent when seeking re-election he went out and and gave some speeches and so forth. They weren't officially campaign events but he happened to be out on the road in swing states. After the War of 1812 one of his military aides began and another finished uh, biography of Andrew Jackson which dealt with his early life and dealt frankly with his military uh, story and dealt even with the occasions in which Jackson was brutal, having his own soldiers executed, for example, for disobedience. He, he uh, I was about to say he talks about it in the book, his aides write uh-huh. about this in the book, but it's essentially an authorized biography is what it is. Mm-hmm. And it gets put out there and it massively accelerates his already great fame. People retrospectively have called it the first campaign biography. Every candidate does one of these. I don't know that that's exactly right, but I'm sure that on some level he knew what he was doing and it became something that served his ambition later on. And Jackson, even though he wasn't giving campaign speeches, was deeply engaged in messaging. He was a huge newspaper reader. He subscribed to as many as 17 newspapers at one time. And in fact, when he got into office, you've heard the phrase kitchen cabinet. Everybody in school learns Mm -hmm. a few sentences about Andrew Jackson, and one is that he had a kitchen cabinet of informal advisors. The informal advisors, several of them were newspaper men. And he would bring them in and get them a government job so that they would have a a salary and they would be helping to craft messages. He was thinking a lot about narrative. As had happened so many times before in his life, Jackson had started a fight, this time for the presidency, and he knew how to win it. But it also forced his opponents to fight back 
That narrative of him as a tough war commander was turned right back on him. It was used in much the same way that we see candidates today try to use each other's stories against them. This is one of the things that would come back to haunt Jackson when he ran for president. His critics were saying, wait a minute, he's, he's a killer. Uh, not only the Indian Wars, but the people that he executed. And one of the things that was used against him in his campaigns was um, what was called the Coffin Handbill, which was a, a broadside that was produced that had six black coffins on it representing six members of his own troops who he had executed for insubordination or for deserting. And this was one of the charges made against him, this, this tendency to execute when perhaps it was not necessary. And of course, we can play on the metaphor of execute an executive and his executive authority. This is an example that he wasn't afraid to wield executive authority, even overcoming uh, lesser sentences that had been recommended in court martials. And he did the same thing as president when he used the veto power. As Steve Inskeep said to me, the heart of Jackson is the fight. And the fact that if he didn't have one, he would go find one. That in many ways, Steve says, is democracy. People are allowed to be and supposed to be fighting with each other. Jackson's opponents thought he wanted to be Caesar, but Steve says what he wanted was the ability to fight and win in the democratic system. Voter turnout more than doubled between that first time Jackson lost the presidency and the next election when he overwhelmingly wins. In some ways, the country might have been better if everything Jackson did hadn't been done just that way. Uh, but in some ways, it might have been worse. He made it a more open and boisterous and energetic democracy. Fights, even for the victors, though, are not without bloodshed. And if that duel years ago leaves a bullet lodged near his heart, this battle for the Oval Office hits directly in the center of it. His wife, Rachel, dies. She ends up attacked throughout the campaign for not having fully divorced her first abusive husband before marrying Jackson years ago. Shortly before Jackson's inauguration, she dies of a heart attack. Jackson is absolutely devastated, and he is sure, for the rest of his life, that the cause of her death is the venom and the vitriol of the election. He buries her on Christmas Eve in the garden of their home in Tennessee. When the earth is shoveled over her, she is in the white dress that she picked out to wear for his inauguration. I don't want to be overly Freudian about mm -hmm. it, but I think in some ways, again, he was orphaned. Yeah, you know, it was like his mother dying all over again. Now his wife, um, who was in some ways so much like his mother, has died, and his real partner in life. And of course, he was in deep mourning. So when he goes through his inauguration, he is a very recent widower, and he is wearing black, and he's wearing a top hat that has a black mourning band on it. He gets a very short inaugural address. And it's greatly in contrast to all the mob excitement over his election. And it really was unprecedented, the number of people who traveled to Washington to celebrate that he, somebody that represented them, just common people, not highly educated people, not people that had a, had a lot of privilege or opportunity, but everyday people. They came in droves here to Washington. There was a big parade. Um, and they mob the White House. They basically have a huge party. The White House ends up full of people drinking, dragging barrels of alcohol out onto the lawn. There's rumor that a grand piano is thrown out a second story window of the White House. You know, basically, for a short while, the people took over the White House, mm -hmm. and it was symbolic and it was a real party. But he, of course, was removed from all this um, because of the sorrow that he was experiencing. Yet in the two terms he serves as president, he's still just as much of a fighter. 
He's guided, perhaps, by the same formula that made him refuse to shine that British officer's boots as a boy, that made him challenge people to duels, that made him execute insubordinates within his own militia, that made him obliterate opponents in battle. It's a formula that says, the only hope for stopping chaos and unending tragedy is not through seeking peace, and it's not through compromise, and it's not through acquiescence. It's through a strategic and definitive show of force. This type of strong executive style was new for the Oval Office. But though firm, his presidential orders and objectives were also at times contradictory. He was for limited government and states' rights, but when South Carolina did not want to comply with a federal law and said it should have the right not to, Jackson fiercely defended the Union and was ready to send troops to South Carolina to enforce their compliance. He said he wanted common man presidents, not monarchs, and yet he vetoed more legislation and wielded more executive power than any of his predecessors. All the contradictory things you just said are all simultaneously true. Um, One of the other biographers of, of Jackson has a very simple phrase to describe Jackson's political philosophy. He did what he liked. Um, He was a guy who passionately believed in limited government. We've had this whole debate throughout the history of the United States over the size and scale and power of the federal government. He was a limited government guy. He was a Jeffersonian limited government guy. But within that, he wanted to do what he wanted to do. He wanted to balance the federal government and cut government spending, but he wanted money to be spent where he wanted it to be spent. He, uh, you know, believed in good and efficient government, but was perfectly happy to fire a lot of established civil servants and bring in new people. Uh, He would say that was on behalf of the common people. Everybody should have a turn at a government job. But of course, in reality, that became the patronage system. They happened to be political supporters of Andrew Jackson who, who got these jobs. He was deeply skeptical of federal road building programs, but if the road was being built in an area that was run by his political supporters, he would be more sympathetic to the road. Uh, he, he, he was, I guess you'd say flexible is the kindest <laughs> thing you could say about that. He, he didn't worry terribly about consistency. What he did worry about was his own authority. That was really important to him. He did not want his authority to be challenged. He didn't want anyone to get away with challenging his authority, and he would, he would stop it at nothing. He uh, got in a battle over the Bank of the United States, the central bank of his, his time, and it became more and more intense, this fight. It became dangerous to the economy. Plenty of people were, were harmed, and he did not back down. And finally, a moment came when he decided he was going to withdraw the United States-owned deposits from the United states own bank and put them somewhere else. And his Treasury Secretary wouldn't do this because it wasn't legal and resigned, and Jackson did it anyway. Uh, so he wasn't really worried about the law that much. What was important to him was that his authority be sustained. And sometimes that was a a great trait. Sometimes it was an appalling trait because people would say, you are destroying thousands of lives by pushing Native Americans off of their lands in the eastern United States. And you are also, by the way, violating the law and the, the findings of the Supreme Court. And he would ignore that and push ahead. It could be an awful, awful trait. But I think it is something ultimately that is essential in a leader and especially a democratic leader because you can't give one fiat, give one order and make everything go your way. You have to push ahead over time to get in the direction that you want to go. And that was something that he had an ability to do. Um, He believed that what he wanted was what the people wanted. So if you'd asked him, he would say that he was fighting on behalf of the people. And his definition of the people's desires was whatever Andrew Jackson wanted. I think that's how he, that's how he managed that contradiction. But there's another question here, too, which is, who does he think all these people he represents are? We often think of Andrew Jackson as the man of the people. And that is, of course, that's what the Jacksonian era is, is ushering in a new political climate, which was really class-based, which was really about expanding... Uh, the white male uh, voter uh, population to 
include the popular vote, include working men, include people in trades and artisans, and especially um, white wage workers and people who wanted to settle on farms. So really he's the champion of the white working class, um, while at the same time he is the representative of the southern plantation slave-owning gentry. So there's a lot of contradiction there even on the matter of class. But he wasn't representing enslaved people, he was actually killing and removing Native Americans. He certainly didn't represent the rights of women, um, so it's a question of when we think of this popular vote and this popular following, what people is he talking, what's he talking about? A large way that Jackson fights for the common Southern white man is by securing much of the land that we now think of as the Deep South. Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi. We already talked about how before his presidency, Jackson led many military campaigns against Native Americans. Well, as president, he becomes responsible for the Indian Removal Act, which is essentially large-scale relocation and segregation of Native Americans. The government basically forces Native Americans to leave their homes and their homeland in these southern areas and to march to present-day Oklahoma to relocate. In Jackson's view, this is a decisive way to stop ongoing fighting over those lands and to secure them for the white working class. This means the real estate can be opened up for use by white farmers, which is to say that much of that land turns into more slave plantations. So in fighting to help the common white southerner, this land policy ultimately further deepens two huge national tragedies. It expands the footprint of slavery throughout the South, and these marches, most of which are actually carried out under the next president, end up leaving more than 10,000 Native Americans dead. This comes to be called the Trail of Tears. Here's John Meacham. His legacy has shifted through time. Uh, he was seen as a great populist Democrat, lowercase d and uppercase d, for a long time. Uh, as our awareness of uh, the plight of Native Americans and um, the experience of sl enslaved people grew, Jackson's historical stock fell. My view of Jackson is that while his views on those matters were on the extreme edge of the mainstream of his time, they were still within the mainstream. And his sins were the nation's sins. And so to condemn him without condemning the nation itself is sort of a cop-out. We can't simply blame Andrew Jackson for Native American removal and the endurance of slavery. The nation was complicit in those um, in those tragedies as well. The legacy and controversy of Andrew Jackson is still very raw today, two centuries later. I asked Steve Inskeep about the reactions he gets when people learned he wrote a book about Jackson. You must hear people who say, oh, I love Jackson, or oh, I hate Jackson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's your... Um, What's your reaction to to those sort of responses that I think even today we can get people with such very different sort of reads on uh, him? I discovered that all the way through writing the book. Anybody I mentioned this project to would say, oh, well, my, uh, my aunt was Cherokee, or my, my son is named Andrew Jackson, so-and-so. And I mean, I, I've run into that. Um, all the, the entire gamut. And some people have been quite upset, like, why are you beating up on that poor Andrew Jackson? Uh, and some people have been a little upset the other way. How can you even mention Andrew Jackson? And the strength of opinion, I think, says something about this particular story. It is a great tragedy in American history that was not resolved, that was not ended or atoned for in any way. Slavery is the other great original sin, it is said, of early America. But whatever else America has done wrong, America faced that problem, and hundreds of thousands of people were killed to end that problem. 
and even if it was later converted into other forms of the same problem, racism, you, you, you had a reckoning. There wasn't really a reckoning for this. Uh, the Indians, Native Americans, were pushed aside uh, and deprived of their land, often by fraudulent or appalling or violent means, and, and that was the end of it. And so it's still alive, and it's still something to debate, and it's still something you feel really passionately. I remember in elementary school learning just a fragment about this. I don't know if you learned anything in elementary school about this. People do or maybe don't, or maybe it's junior high school, actually, but like a page. Yeah. It's like a page in, 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 a, in a history book, like one of those little side uh, sidebars. And, and yet I remember little details from that. There's description of Indians who had become like white people living in white people's houses and soldiers showed up at their door and made them leave. And as a little kid, you remember that because it seems so very, very wrong. And I think this is a story that we still feel and that we still ought to feel because it wasn't fixed then and probably there's no way to fix it now but we ought to remember it and know it and know that it's part of our legacy. Um, what do you think is one of either the biggest lessons or biggest questions that a study of Jackson begs us to ask? What I realized in looking at Jackson's era was that America then was facing one of the same huge questions that it faces now. We are increasingly conscious that we're in a very diverse country that's becoming more diverse all the time, and it's a development that underlies a lot of the news of our era, and certainly most of the politics of our era. It's back in the background there somewhere on issue after issue after issue. When you study Jackson's time of almost a couple centuries ago, you realize that the United States was very diverse then, and that there were many different kinds of people then. And so that question isn't new. They also came up with a terrible, terrible answer to that question. Jackson's own Democratic Party essentially answered the question by saying that Americans are white people. That was the, the platform, uh, unspoken and eventually quite loudly spoken, of the Democratic Party of Jackson's day. A terrible answer. But they were wrestling with that question. And there were people at the time who had better answers to the question. And because it's a democracy, which became more democratic in Jackson's era, we've continued to argue and argue that question and come up with better answers over time. I asked John Meacham, too, what we stand to learn from a study of Jackson today. His life was intrinsically dramatic, intrinsically fascinating. And I think we see in him many of the contradictions sins and shortcomings and possibilities of the country itself. If you're wondering what violent tragedy ultimately kills Andrew Jackson, the answer is that he dies in a way that, in all the death he saw, he had hardly ever witnessed. He dies quite softly, of old age, old injuries, old illnesses. He dies at home in his bed in Tennessee, and he's buried in the garden beside Rachel. Special thanks this week to guests Steve Inskeep, John Meacham, and Barbara Baer. Music for the podcast is by Dave Wessner. As always, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at presidential underscore WP if you want to keep talking about Andrew Jackson all week. And there is still so much to examine. His fight with the bank, the nullification crisis, the Peggy Eaton controversy, the kitchen cabinet he keeps. Not the actual kitchen cabinet he keeps. His presidency, the kitchen cabinet. You'll just have to forgive me that, as with all these presidents, I can't fit everything into one episode. But... We have now witnessed the ushering in of Jacksonian democracy, which means that several of the coming presidents pick up and carry forth his philosophies. So in a way, we will keep talking about the legacy of Andrew Jackson for a while yet. Next week, we look at the man who follows him, Martin Van Buren. He's known as the Little Magician. We'll find out why. <laughs>